last year, 57,391 Australians died of heart disease. Cardiovascular disease is the biggest killer of Australians. And it's our most expensive disease. Last year, 50, uh, sorry, $5.9 billion was spent treating heart disease. Our speaker today has something to say on this subject that I think is so valuable that we've invited him to speak to us here at Fountain in the city today. I had the pleasure of listening to Dr. Hans Deal present last weekend. And you know, it was so outstanding what he had to say that I said to myself, our members at Fountain in the City need to hear this. And uh, Dr. Hans Deal has graciously agreed to come all the way into the heart of Sydney to share this valuable information with us today. And friends, I believe that after hearing his presentation, your life will not be the same again. That's how important his message is today. So, Dr. Deal, it's with pleasure that I welcome you to Fountain in the City today, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pastor Gary. It was an incredible weekend at Surfers Paradise last weekend. And it wasn't the surface paradise. I mean, they talk about the Sunshine Coast. I couldn't find it. But I found something very incredible, and that is the ministry of a man and his wife that is changing people's lives everywhere. I was fired up. I mean, I was pumped up. As a matter of fact, I came to him afterwards and said, Gary, if I was 25 years of age, I would know exactly what to do. I would join you and you can mentor me. I was so fired up hearing the stories of turnaround lives, to see God alive. Beautiful. And the reaching out to people through television in a new way, it was very, very, very special. I could hardly get, uh, wait to get on uh, to Sydney here to call my wife from my phone that I had there. I said, honey, this is unbelievable. This is one of my best weekends. I mean, I was baptized when I was 16, 15, 16 years of age in Germany. That was a high point too. And that point determined the rest of my life, actually. That's what happens. When you find Jesus, you cannot remain the same. Change my priorities. Influence whom I married. Influence my diet or lifestyle. Influence my career. I was a businessman. Turned it totally upside down. Because I began to realize that I wanted to sell the milk of human kindness. To see other people turning around. And to find that inner center that is not just grabbing for attention, but a center that talks not about I, but talks about we. We. And I is spelled illness, and we is spelled wellness. Are you with me? There's more than just eating right. You have to also include the spirit, the kindness, to knowing who you really are that wants to make a difference in another person's life. And that's what happened to me because of him. So let me just tell you one little story. Um, you know, Pastor Gary talked about 70,000 people dying in Australia. That's nothing. It's 800,000 in America. Of course, we got about 10 times more people. So you see, the, re the relationships, the ratios are pretty much the same. 
whenever you live in a in a Western industrialized country or any country that eats like we eat and that lives like we live, you will always have an epidemic of heart disease, of cancer, different kinds of cancer, of diabetes, of hypertension, of obesity. They're always there. I got a call from Dubai, and the government called. They said, "Look." 25 years ago, we had no diabetes in this place here. 25 years ago. We became westernized about 15 years ago, and that's when the epidemic of diabetes began. No country is safe that begins to copy what we're doing here in Australia, in New Zealand, in America, in Canada, you eat like these countries and these countries that have never had this disease before within five to ten years will have similar diseases emerging on their shores. Are you with me? That's shocking, isn't it? That's what we do as epidemiologists. We study the epidemics and we say, how come in these countries these diseases are very rare and in these countries they're very popular? And then begin to look at what is the difference in the lives of these people. Do they have medicine? Do they have medicine? How do they eat? How do they eat? Do they smoke? Do they not smoke? And begin to look at some of these lifestyle factors and we begin to realize it is always by and large a similar lifestyle. How people live is largely how they die. And people say to me, well, well, then it's not so bad, is it? Because we're living now 30 years longer than people had years ago. Right? I have some news for you. 100 years ago, I'm giving you some American statistics now. 100 years ago, in America, every fifth baby died during the first year. How many people, how many babies do you think died today in America? Every fifth baby? No. It's less than 1%. Then it was over 20%. Are you picking up what I'm driving at? So if you have virtually no baby dying today, those babies then reduce the life expectancy. So when you read statistics, they will always say life expectancy at birth. But if 20% of the babies die, that reduces the life expectancy on the average at birth. And that's one of the big factors why we don't live really 30 really years longer today. You would have to ask the question differently. You would ask the question a hundred years ago. How long did a person live that had gone beyond babyhood, right? No longer dying before the age of one, right? And you look at a 21-year-old, or you look at a 40-year-old, or you look at a 65-year-old. You ask the question, how long did a 65-year-old man expect to live in America a hundred years ago? You know what the answer is? Once made it to 65, They could live to 77 then. So there was no medical care in America 100 years ago. We spent 1% of our money on medical care. And adults, once they've overcome the childhood diseases and maybe wars, they could expect to live 77 years. No medical care. I said, well, what is it today? Well, today we're spending, in America, 18% of our earnings on medical care. That's 18 times more. Well, how long does a 65-year-old man live today? Well, 85. So how many years have we really gained as adults? From 77 to 85? Turn your computers on. No. <laughs> 
probably eight years. But when you read statistics that say life expectancy at birth, they'll show you it was 49 years, 100 years ago, and they will show you today, it's more like 77. So they said, aha, so it is 30 years longer today, wow. And then people say, some wise crap, oh, that's why we have so much heart disease, oh, that's why we have so much cancer. These are all diseases of aging. See? Not true. Let me give you some other thing to think about. When I used to go to school, which was a couple of years ago, <laughs> in those days, we were told, when you have a person over 60 and fat, always check for high blood sugar, because diabetes and overweight, they go hand in hand. But that was... Yeah, that was 35 years ago. That was the directives that we had. Person over 60 and fat, check their blood sugar. They could be diabetics. Well, let me tell you something. Today, when we look for diabetics, we look for 50-year-olds and 40-year-olds and 30-year-olds. And now we look for 50. <coughs> Teen year old teenagers like this, diabetics. <coughs> Type 2 diabetics. We used to call these people adult onset because we thought it only happens when they get older. Now we have teenagers as adult onset diabetics. Oh. We are in the midst of one of the largest epidemics that we've ever witnessed of Western diseases. We used to call them Western diseases. No more, no more because they're becoming global diseases. In the old days, some 30, 40 years ago, it was only the rich nations that could afford these foods. See, they would take potatoes and turn them into potato chips. And with that, they increased the number of calories in those chips and those potatoes dramatically. You know, you can have do you have Pringles here in Australia? Yeah. Yeah. You know those troops? Actually, that much is air, right? <laughs> so it's about this much. When you eat this, that's the same number of calories as 11 potatoes. And sometimes people come to me and say, oh, I try to lose weight, I can't eat potatoes. Oh, that's the best way to lose weight. No calories in potatoes. Now, if you put a lot of stuff on, like butter and cheese and all that, yeah, that's another story. Remember, when you turn from potatoes into potato chips or potato fingers, yeah, 10 times more calories. Are you with me? So I asked my medical students, I teach in medical school part time, and so I asked them, um, I said, how does it take you to eat those Pringles? I said, oh, we inhale them. <laughs> <laughs> we watch television and the thing's already empty. Yeah, it is. See, we watch, we don't even know what we're doing. That's the modern lifestyle. So I said, well, so they have a little discussion there and uh, they finally decided it would take them 13 minutes to eat 1,100 calories. Now that's, uh, you have kilojoules here, right? Can anybody translate that for me? 1,100 calories, how many kilojoules? Is that about times four or 40 or something? On how much nutrition literacy do we have here? <laughs> I, I'm a stranger, I, I have an excuse. Uh, anybody here? Have you heard of kilojoules? Yeah. Oh, you yeah. have? Who has heard of kilojoules? Okay, how many have heard of calories? Oh, okay, so that's actually more common than here, right? Yeah, but at any rate. So you understand when I talk about a thousand one hundred calories, right? That's a lot. Yeah. That's one third of a pound of fat, actually. So I asked these medical students, how long does it take you to eat those one thousand one hundred calories? They said, 13 minutes. Now I said, if I give you the equivalent in potatoes, which is 11 potatoes, how long would it take you to eat those? 
It's also the same number of calories. They said, oh, about two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> See, as we refine our food supply in Western society, we get into trouble. You want to know more about this? Or you rather not? I may be spoiling your fun. <laughs> but you'd be healthy. <laughs> it was seven minutes to seven that night. And I had my hand on the door handle of this large door. I was going to be opening it any second now because there were 1,500 people waiting for me the fourth night of a 16-night series on health. It was in a small town in Canada, British Columbia. And the people had come from everywhere. It was in the midst of winter, but they came. I figured they had nothing else to do, so they came to hear uh, some German accent. So they came, fourth night. And I was just about ready to get into the building, because when you have German, uh, and many of these people were of German origin in that town, and when you have this kind of a situation, German people are always very, very punctual, or at least when they were back home they used to be, right? And so I knew if I would be one minute late, they would be upset. So I've always made it, being German myself, I made a point to always be there at least a couple of minutes before. So this was seven minutes to go. I'm ready to go to the auditorium, and then somebody calls my voice. And I'm not available, I'm sorry, I, I can't see anybody. I have to be inside there. That's where these people are waiting for me. And then the voice came back, Sir, Dr. Dio, we drove seven hours to see you. Teresa and I, do you remember us? We were in your graduation class six months ago in the small town of Creston. Oh, yeah. That's a small little town there. There were 4,000 people in the town, and 400 people came out night after night after night. And they were interested in health. And so I have a responsibility to my graduates, and here apparently are some graduates, and they say, don't you remember us? <laughs> Not out of 400. I'm Bob and Teresa Anderson. We drove seven hours to see you to tell you what happened to us. Six months earlier, they graduated from my program, remember? I said to myself, I cannot talk to them right now because these people are waiting inside. And then I had a bright idea. And I said, oh, by the way, Bob, would you mind coming in with me? I mean, would you come in? There are some people inside, and you can tell me and all the people the story. I expected a great story. <laughs> You've got to be careful. <laughs> he said, no problem, sir. Wow, here's this 66-year-old man. I mean, most people are petrified when they're being asked to speak in front of 1,500 people. He said, yes, sir, yes. Well, I take him inside. One minute to seven. I take him up on the podium. And then I make my second mistake. I give him a mic. <laughs> this man takes the mic, but before that I introduce him. And I said, folks, you have 1,500 people there, fourth night of the series. I say, you know, I have some special friends here from Creston, the town. They've graduated six months ago, and they want to share with you what happened to them. And I'm also very much anxious to hear the story. So I give him the mic. He said, ladies and gentlemen, he points at me. Don't believe everything that this man is telling you. I didn't hear right. And then he said, this man promised us that if we follow his dietary program and his lifestyle, we could reduce our food bill by 35%. But let me tell you, this man, don't believe everything he says, because this man cost us $30,000. And all of a sudden, I stood there naked. <laughs> I had established myself as a scientist for the audience the last three sessions. And in just one paragraph, it was gone. 
Hij stond er nek. En ik begon te realiseren dat het niet zo'n such a bright idea was om hem te geven. I never did. <laughs> I was shocked. How would I get out of this hole? And then he continues and he says, let me tell you what happened to us on our fourth night. Remember, this was their fourth night. But I have to also tell you something else. When it comes to CHIP program, the Complete Health Improvement Program, that's really a 40 for zero hour course. So it's pretty intense. And people meet there almost every night. Because they taught me, if you come and teach us once a week, there are six days of McDonald's we cannot resist. And I didn't want to be away from my home. I live in Southern California for these many, many weeks. I mean, it was long enough, four weeks. I have a beautiful wife, I had two children, and that was a big sacrifice as it was. But I really enjoyed learning how to reach people with the gospel of hell. And so I have to tell you, when I start the series in a town, in a city. I never talk about foods. That comes later on. I first talk about what is chronic disease? How is the body made? What does atherosclerosis mean? You know, the narrowing in the, the artery, the artery, the artery. How, how does this happen? And, 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 and what does that do? Oh, you mean Hearing loss, and memory loss, and visual loss, and coronary disease, and strokes, and kidney disease, and impotence. It's all the same disease? Yeah. Because this is a disease called atherosclerosis that begins to invade all of our circulatory system. Would you know how many kilometers, 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 kilometers of blood vessels in the human body? Any idea? Thousands. Thousands? Thousands of miles? A kilometers? Oh, probably. Must be a large person. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? How many kilometers? Um, I should actually know this. Too. Really? Yeah. Why? Oh, 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 no, no, I shouldn't ask you then. <laughs> one kilometer? One kilometer, okay. Ten kilometers? A little louder? Ten. Yes. How many? Fifteen. You're playing it safe. Right? <laughs> Would you believe hundred thousand kilometers of blood vessels in one body? One hundred thousand? And most of the vessels, the capillaries, are smaller than the thickness of your hair. So that this capillary system, this very refined network of vessels, smaller than our hair, can bring blood to every one of these hundred trillion cells that make up our body. We are wonderfully and Fearfully, fearfully made. Awesome! An engineering feat second to none. So I talk to people the first two, three, four days about how the body works, how it's being made, try to get some um, basic understanding, and then on the fourth night, I begin to talk about overweight. And of course, then you have to talk about exercise and food. And then begin to lay the foundation of how our food, you know, like with the Pringles. How everything is very sophisticated now. The food is sophisticated and costly. And 
It creates big profits for the company, companies and big bodies for the users. And these modern foods today, they subtract nutrition. And they add calories. Not in your best interest. So, this is the fourth night. Now remember, I do not make recommendations to people. As of tomorrow, thou shalt no longer smoke. As of tomorrow, thou shalt exercise every day. As of tomorrow, no more praying. No. It unfolds in time as people see lecture after lecture, the scientific data, and then people can make choices of what they think they're ready to do. If they want to become vegetarians, that's a great way to go. It doesn't have to be. But it's important to get on the bus. It's important to get on the bus of getting into a walking program, an exercise program, get in the gym, getting on the bus, starting. That's the important part. So this is the fourth night. And this man tells 1,500 people what he did. He said, it was the fourth night, and on my way home that night, Teresa turns to me and says, Bob, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. How about you? Um, okay. But I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. We're going to make some changes. When we get home, we're going to make some changes. So I just want to, to be prepared. So he said to these people, we're driving into the driveway. It's dark, it's late at night. And my wife, uh, uh, I hope I get out of the car. I'm trying to be a gentleman. And then we walk into the house. And then she said, Bob, you've been smoking two and three packs of Marlboros every day. Bob, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And have you become sick and tired? And then I have to take care of you. We want to change now, tonight. Okay. That night I do what to do. Oh, I had these beautiful cartons of Marlboros. She handed me the matches. I knew what to do. I had no choice. And then after that, she said, you know, big fire. After that, she said, Bob, from now on, the only one smoking in this house is going to be the fireplace. And I said, yes, yeah, okay. So I thought that was okay. And then he said, but then she came up with these two large olive green bags. I mean, they were huge. And I said, what's that for? He said, Bob, well, we're going to go downstairs now to the basement where the big two freezers are. Oh. So I follow her down uh, to the basement, and she holds these two big, well, she started with one, of course, uh, garbage bag, and then she opened up that freezer, that big freezer, and said, Bob, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. We're going to clean this thing out tonight. I looked at her, and I thought, well, why do you want to do that? He said, I looked at my favorite silver steak there. I looked at my chicken there, and one of the fish kind of looked at me funny. <laughs> and then I said to her, but Teresa, he has never said anything about foods. It's the fourth night, remember? She said, oh, you have selective memory. You just don't want to listen, do you? You don't want to remember, right? He talked about if it has a face or mother don't eat it. Oh, if it has a face? <laughs> Oh, mother, you don't want to eat it. Oh, he said that? Well, I didn't hear it. I know, but he said it. Well, we're going to clean this up. Now, come on, let's do it. So, so much day, chicken, fish, sausages, everything. There were a few peas, and there were fruit beans, and a few raspberries, and blueberries, but basically it was all, you know, animal products and some processed food. Well, actually, 
We thought these two olive green garbage bags. <laughs> then she said, now let's go upstairs now. And she took me to the kitchen and she had another one of these big bags. I said, no, Bob, let's get into the refrigerator here, freezer. And I looked at my Hagen dust ice cream. Oh. <laughs> And I'm a little bit worried because, you know, if you pile too many things onto people too fast, then you have to do it quietly as they get ready for the next step. But he just put it all out at these people. And he said, well, they win. And then she took me to the pantry. And I looked at my... Mm, what do you call these black and white cookies? Oh, yeah. You have those here too? Yes. My goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Oreos. So he said, I, I looked at these Oreos and I was really relieved because no face, no mother. I thought I was safe. And then he said, well, but he said something about refined foods too, didn't he? I don't remember that. <laughs> Bob, you don't want to remember. That's the problem. Bob, this is, I don't want to eat this stuff anymore. It's artificial food. I want to have real food. I want to be healthy. I don't want to be in this hospital. Our doctor told us we should be eating differently. And we're in the hospital every year. We're going to change. <laughs> the biscuits. All the wonderful things that were there. The M&Ms. <laughs> yeah, those two. What do you, I saw something, what is it, Tim Tams or something? Yeah. And then I saw Kit Kats here. Yeah. <laughs> you want to know where they took those garbage bags, right? I know. <laughs> so, so he said, oh, we're in those the garbage bags. And, and then I said, oh, Lord, stop him. He's scaring all these people away. And then he said, to all these people innocently, he said, and then Teresa took me to the wet bar, to the wet bar, and, oh, this is my favorite whiskey, this is my bourbon, and, oh, no, 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 and, and then he said, Bob, I'm sick and tired of us being saying that, let's pour it up, and he said, no, no, this is liquid grains, grains are on the list. <laughs> If it was first standing over me like a sergeant. <laughs> I said, Lord. I was praying and said, Lord, these people will never come back. I mean, everybody knows that the wine is probably good for the heart somehow. We have this idea. Uh, and here, uh, he is pouring all this stuff. No, no. I said, it's a Lord, send an earthquake right now <laughs> to stop this man from talking. And the Lord said, son, just relax. Okay. I mean, this is, this is Canada. This is not California. No. North. I said, Lord, if you cannot send an earthquake, then have a transformer or something blow. So all that electricity goes out. I mean, this man is he's destroying my program. He's only talked for 20 minutes. I was going to give him three minutes. That was my third mistake. And I thought to myself, well, you make that mistake only once. But this is the end now. I mean, nobody's going to come back. I mean, he takes everything away from them. That makes life worth living. <laughs> nobody's going to come back. They think this is some kind of a crazy scheme or something here. So I thought I'd call my wife. This was Thursday, and I said to myself, well, I'm going to call Lily, I'm going to make some arrangements on Monday, I'm going to be home on Tuesday, be with the kids, and it's going to be, no, no, it's all right. You know, this man kept on talking. I mean, he's a 66 year old man. And then, oh, I should insert something here. 
Do you, you know something about the CHIP program, right? Yeah. yeah. So if we have this hard screen before the program and after the program, right? And we measure people, we take their weight, their blood pressure, we draw some blood, and uh, we measure their cholesterol and their blood sugar, all these kind of things. And then we, they fill out a questionnaire uh, so we have an idea of what they are, how they live, what they do, what the history is. And then we have usually someone to fill this all in and make recommendations to what would be the best way to overcome these problems, right? So that's what we call a heart screen. We do it before the program, and then if it's a four-week program at the end of four weeks. Or if it's an eight-week program, we do it at the end of eight weeks. So it's before and after, so people can see for themselves, is it working or not? Let me tell you something. The people continue the program because they see the results after four to eight weeks and they're shocked. Their cholesterol levels are down 50 to 25, 30% in just four weeks. We have over 50,000 people in our data banks. We've published in medical journals 23 articles already on this. Not a secret. The blood sugar levels go down, so much so that physicians have to take the people down on their medication, on their insulin injections. We sometimes have people off totally off insulin in four to eight weeks. These people eat all they want of the right foods, and they lose usually, let me see, um, eight, that's about uh, four kilos. I mean, they eat all they want. We don't tell them, you have to stop after so many bites, you have to push it. No, eat all you want until you're full because you cannot overeat on foods that come out of the hand of the master designer. You cannot gain weight on potatoes, or on mangoes, or on green beans, or on apples, or on whole green products like wheat bits. <laughs> That, that's an Australian product, isn't it? Yeah. I work for them, so. <laughs> I had to say that. No, 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 no. that's okay. But, but you see, we do the hard screens before and after, and the man told these people, he said, when I got my hard screen results back, I could not believe it. My cholesterol was down, my blood sugar was down. I mean, really, I came into this program because my doctor told me to do that, and I had high blood pressure. I was on three medications. I was 65 pounds, that's about uh, 30 kilos overweight. He said, I had, I was a pre diabetic, and I had severe arthritis in my back so much so that I could hardly bend over. And I basically was confined to my sofa, to the couch, I was a couch potato. My strongest muscle in the body was a muscle right here. Oh, I could serve those channels. Nothing else. As a matter of fact, I had to retire early. I was a builder and he said, uh, the um, darkest day of my adult life was when I saw my physician drive into my backyard and he brought the firewood for the winter season. It was my darkest day of my life. His two boys took that firewood and they sawed it and then they, um, they cut it and they stacked it in my backyard. It was my darkest life, because at that moment I realized that I was no longer in charge of my own life. I was no longer independent. I had to rely on other people to take care of me and my wife to bring the winter season's wood. It was devastating. It was depressive. And so, when we got the results back at the end of the program, Oh, they were good. And we felt better, we had lost weight, medications were down, uh, my wife had really big, big time improvements too. She had severe depression, she was a full-blown diabetic, the doctor had to take her down on the medication, and we were really enthused about the program. And then we said, but you know, everybody in that program, after the first week, sort of begins to walk. I mean, they weren't walking, but he said, we didn't walk at all because of my arthritis, but yeah. It's getting better. 
Maybe we should do some walking now too. So they get to walk every morning. 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, in the foothills of the big Rocky Mountains there. Great stuff. And then he tells these people, I was getting kind of bored with the same routines. And so uh, I call up my son, who lives in Southern California, and who is sort of a semi-professional cyclist. And I said, son, can a man 66 years of age learn how to ride a bike? And my son said, um, Dad, uh, are you talking about yourself? Um, yeah. Yeah, Dad, you can do it. But yeah, you can do it, but you have to get the best bike. You get there was titanium bikes, 21 gears, altimeter. Do it right, Dad. You can do it and get those special gloves without the fingers and get those special layout tarts because that reduces the wind resistance when you drive, when you, when you, when you cycle. Dad, do it right. So he tells these people, you know, about four months after we had graduated from this program, four months later, I find myself with Teresa driving south of the Canadian border into the, Canadian, into the American territory. We went to a cycling shop there. And he said, I haven't been in a shop like that for 30, 40 years. First of all, I have sticker shock. I mean, bikes cost that much money today. But I heard my boy, the voice of my son in my ear, and I talked to the clerk and I said, you know, we're looking for a good bike. Titanium. Oh. He had a smile on his face. It was going to be a good sale for him. And then I told him, 21 gears. Okay, yes, sir. And, 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 and we want to have the altimeter. And uh, do you have those special gloves without finger? Yes, sir. Wow, I was really doing exactly what my son told me. I was going to become a cyclist at 66. He said it was not too late. And then I moved over to the other place there in the shop where they have these leotards. And then Teresa came along. I didn't know that she would have some kind of a eruption. She says, what are you doing here? What are you going to do with your sake of anything? Are you going to wear those? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My son told me I had to get those because, uh, you know, it's wind resistance and so on and so forth. And she said, but. If you're going to wear these in our small little conservative town, <laughs> you're going to drive at night. <laughs> so I got it. I would wear it down, I figure. And on the way home, she turns to me and she says, Bob, hmm, do you realize this? You have spent over $2,000 on your own, for yourself. But what about me? <laughs> well, what do you want, a bike? No, no, I don't want a bike. I want a piano. A, 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 a big party? A piano? Yes. I knew I was in trouble. Now, do you want to have one of those baby grand pianos? No, 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 just a regular studio piano. And then I thought I was still in trouble. I said, now, does it have to be a new one? I said, no, 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 that's okay, just not regular, you use it's fine. But keep some money in reserve because I'm going to take piano lessons. Now, he said to the audience, you know, I had to bite my tongue not to say anything. But then, it is true, isn't it? Learning to play the piano is not a matter of how old you are. It all depends how young you are up here. Isn't that right? And when you have hope, like Chip gives people hope. They may be on 19 drugs, 19 pills a day. When they after four weeks begin to see their medication drop off and they feel the fog is lifting. And the weight is coming down. And the insulin is going down. And the high blood pressure medications are gone. Do you know what happens to them? They begin to dream again. Are you with me? So, it became very clear to me, it should cost me $2,000. So 
So you know, at that time, you know, he's not talked for about 35 minutes. He was supposed to be talking for three minutes, I thought. I have this big lecture to give on, on uh, foods, remember? I mean, this is the most important of all the lectures. I mean, this was an important one. I mean, I was very important that night to be there, to speak to them. And I figured, well, okay, $2,000 for the bike, $2,000 for the piano, that's $4,000. And he said something about $30,000, did not he? Did he have a lawsuit or something? You know, what happened? And then he told a bit more of his story. You know, he said he was a building contractor, uh, he was very successful, he enjoyed a cigarette and some bourbon afterwards, but then um, he said, um, once I turned 65, I had a shadow follow me everywhere I would go. The shadow was seven feet long and about two and a half, three feet wide. And everywhere I would go, that shadow would follow me. Because you see, my dad died at 62, and I thought I must be in that coffin any day now. I mean, I was overweight, I had all these medications, I had some angina pain. I mean, I was a cripple. I was just on that couch there. Well, he said, there was one thing I have to share with you. I thought to myself, well, I'll take all the time you want because my lecture time is already over and I'm going to close the program tonight and that's it. So I had come to uh, make peace with myself, recognize that I made a big, big mistake, several actually. So he said, you know, just about a week ago, it was when I felt my wife's elbow in my ribs, and you know, look at my watch, and my wife, with heavy depression and cold lady winters, she would usually get up at about the crack of noon. You know, she'd get up at 11 o'clock, o'clock, and this is, I look at my watch, it's seven o'clock in the morning. Seven o'clock, why is she waking me up? And I said, Teresa, yes? Well, I want to talk to you. Teresa, it's, it's seven o'clock. Well, I've been thinking. Oh, good. <laughs> But why is it we are respectable people, we have a good bank account, and we drive this old 21-year-old jalopy of a box hall? I mean, this is very embarrassing. I mean, we, we can afford a car. Why don't we get a new car? I told my wife, I said, Teresa, I've been trying to get a new car all these years. And every time I tried to buy one, you sabotaged it. You boycotted it. Well, what's going on now? <coughs> and she said, well, you don't understand women, do you? <laughs> she said, Bob, you know, I was 101 kilo. Bob, I was so embarrassed about my weight in our small little town. I was the heaviest, the biggest ton that was walking around. Bob, don't you remember? I would always stay at home. I mean, don't you remember? You, we had plans to go and visit someone, and then in the afternoon, I usually told you, well, Bob, I don't know about, you know, this car is so old. Um, it may not make it home, and uh, uh, it's a small town, not too many lights, and we could get stuck here in the fields. Uh, Bob, Bob, we better stay home. And I always would stay at home. Don't, don't, you, don't you get it? I didn't want to go out. I didn't want anyone to see me because of my expanding girth. I was so embarrassed. But don't you remember, I would always send you out to do the shopping for the last several years? Oh. Oh. Pop, you never put two together? I mean, the pain of obesity, especially for women. Unbelievable. And we men are sometimes like blind men going through a forest. 
totally unaware. Very painful. Especially when they have to compete with those role models on those fancy, beautiful people magazines. <laughs> oh, I see. And so we bought a Chrysler, which cost us $26,000. <laughs> I said, oh. Two and two and twenty-six. Oh, that's the thirty thousand. That was his black humor to tell a story to the audience and to keep them mesmerized at me, totally going out of my mind. <laughs> well, he had taken just about the whole hour. I uh, I took the mic when he when he was finally done. I took the mic uh, and uh, let him sit down. And uh, I closed the meeting. I thanked them for their attention uh, to my dear friend. And uh, I went down to the door. That's where I always go on the last night of the meeting to shake hands with everybody. Let them know I appreciate them. Wish them well. I'm their friend. I want them to succeed. I want them to be healthy. I don't want their money. I want them to be healthy. So I shake hands. And my mind is already in Roma Linda. Mm -hmm. Going home on Tuesday. Call my wife up and say, honey, I made three mistakes. Um, plan to be home on Tuesday. She said, good, good, good. I said, you don't understand. It's really a defeat for me. I made some big mistakes there. They were small at the time, but never again. So on Monday night, I thought I'd just go by there one more time. Just you know, just to see what's going on, and uh, and the parking lot was filled with cars. Oh yeah, they have this wine and cheese party tonight. That's what that is. Yeah, but just out of curiosity, I went to the door to where my auditorium used to be. It's five minutes to seven. I opened the door. The people are all there, and they brought their friends. I mean. This is lecture number five now? I'm not even prepared for it. I get up on stage, it's one minute to seven, I get up on stage and I welcome these people, I tell them how much I enjoy seeing them. And they say, where is Bob? <laughs> they didn't want me. <laughs> what an important lesson about self-importance, isn't it? Where is Bob? Bob, you see, Bob in his, you just couldn't copy him, in his simplicity, in his direct approach, in his uh, sincerity that came across to the people. They just bought into his concept. You see, after I left, they talked to him that previous day. He said, how did you do it? What did we have to eat? Because remember, I told him that several days later. I'm a gradualist. I'm progressively letting the dog out, you see? I'm, I'm progressively disclosing step by step by step. I'm an educator. Bob was the one who gained their favor. They loved Bob. It was our most successful program. We have over 50,000 graduates. I think this must have been our most successful SHIP program because the numbers all looked so good. Because you remember, I let the cat out step by step by step, right? But Bob told them everything on the fourth night, so they had an advance notice, and they could start right away. Well, I was afraid that I might turn them off if I had given too much too soon. Are you with me? Well, let me tell you the rest of the story very quickly now. Do you know how Bob got really fired up? Teresa lost most of her medications. She lost much of her weight. She comes off very nicely, about one kilo or less a week. Nothing too fast, just properly. They became leaders in their chapter there. Every six months they would have 
50, 100, 150 people there, turning the whole town around. They already had 400 people. Remember, there weren't that many people left. And then a year and a half later, October 2, the bells on Parliament Hill in Ottawa, the capital of Canada, are ringing 2 o'clock. And as the big bells chime, you see a lone rider coming up the hill surrounded by the Ottawa Cycling Club. And as the man comes closer, it's Bob. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody's there. The Minister of Health, the Minister of Aging, the Minister of the Elderly. Uh, there's a choir there, and they sing, all oh, when the saints come cycling in. <laughs> <laughs> and the television cameras were there because over the last 60 days, Bob had become a hero. He had become a friend of his Canadian people. Because every night they followed him with the television cameras as he traveled from town to town, from the west coast to the east coast, 3,600 kilometers, at a 67, now 68 year old man. A man that couldn't walk to his mailbox two years earlier and instead took his old Vauxhall car to drive the 200 yards to the mailbox to pick up his mail. Because remember, he wasn't in very good shape. Now, he's traveling 3,600 kilometers from the west coast to the capital of Canada. And everybody's following him because every night he's on the news. And they ask him every night, what's the secret? And he tells them, I learned it in chip. <laughs> no, no chips. I learned it in chip, and he would say, eat simple foods as grown, simply prepared. Are you with me there? That means leave out foods that have nutrition labels, by and large. Right? Have you seen a nutrition label on a tomato? No. Have you seen a nutrition label, you know, those governmental things, on an apple? No. You see it on a mango? No. A durian? No. You see it on whole uh, brown rice? No. Unless it's in a special bag. Do you see it on nuts? No. When it comes out of the hand of the master designer, you don't need nutrition labels. You only need them when you have change the product for profitability, by and large. Quite astounding, isn't it? So he said to them, I learned four principles. Number one, eat foods as grown, super prepared. Number two, burn holes into the soles of your shoes and not the tires of your car exercise every day. Number three, leave out harmful substances such as alcohol, caffeine, cigarettes, and list some of these things. Cut back on those. Try to get away from those. And he said number four, I learned that God didn't make a nobody. God engineered us for success. And I have developed this deep gratitude towards that kind of a God. So he said, develop an attitude of gratitude. And then when he got to the capital, they asked him there on television, and they said, sir, you have done this for 16 days. Uh, what were the hardest things of this trip? He said, well, there are three or four, really. He said, number one, when I traveled across the prairie, prairie, and these are large stretches of land in Canada, and the wind 
There's no elevation, it's all flat. Okay. And so you'd say, when I traveled across the prairie, that long, long stretch, the wind always came from the wrong direction. It's hard. Number two, when I was on that Trans Canada Highway, those big semi trucks would just blow me off the road and I would end up in the gutter many, many times. And I was just lucky that my bike never was irreparably harmed and injured. So that's number two. He said number three. That was just a week ago, he said, when I got to the province of Ontario and we had the first snowfall. It was very hard. Those very narrow racing um, tires very slippery, very, very dangerous. And he said, then uh, there was one more item that was very hard on me, and he said, it's this part right here. <laughs> I mean, he said, I had a gel-packed saddle, but it was hard. And then they said, uh, what helped you to get out of the gutter when you felt, or the next morning when you felt so, Pain for all over your body. Well, he said, let me confide that into you. At the start of my 60 day trip in Creston, in my hometown, there was my physician. There's also a lay minister in the Adventist local church. He was there and he brought his 60 church members out to say goodbye to me. And just as they were saying goodbye to me, uh, the doctor said, uh, Bob and Teresa, Teresa would move along in the car, of course, while he was traveling on the bike. He said, um, I have a little box for you here. It contains 60 love letters. One for each day from our church members here. They want to give this to you. And when you feel you just can't get up, when you feel you feel discouraged, we want you to read one of these love letters. And I want you to remember us here. We're behind you. We're praying for you. And your success is our success. Your love. This man is not a Christian. This man is not an Adventist. This man is just a regular, call him a seeker, whatever you call him. And he said, that's what got me up on that iron horse every day. One letter for every day. I knew they were thinking about me. I couldn't let them down. A year later, I received a phone call. It's Bob. He said, Bob, Bob said, Hans, I have something really happy to share with you. He said, remember these church people there in Creston, those 60 people? You know, when I got back, they gave me a big welcome party, and we have been going to that place ever since. <laughs> and next Sabbath, I'm going to be baptized. Mm -hmm. He said, that love has broken my heart for him. You see, it's not pushing people. You have to eat this and you have to do this. No. Just love people. And they find a response when they're ready for it. Oh, what a powerful lesson for all of us, isn't it? To reach out to people, just be yourself and be loving and do the kind thing that we should be doing anyway. Right? Sell the miracle of human kindness. Yes. It was eight years later, I got another call from Bob. He said, Bob, remember, many years ago, I was forced to retire as a builder. Oh, I love building. But I had to because of my health condition. Remember that shadow following me everywhere we go? He said, listen, I just finished building my doctor's house. Remember. This man was an invalid 10, 15 years ago. Now, 
He's restoring himself. He has become stronger, and he's now finishing his physician's house with great joy. His wife called me two, two and a half years ago, and she said, Hans, Bob has passed away. But before he passed away, he said, be sure you call Hans. Tell him, I'm so grateful for an extra 20 years, of which 18 were good years. And tell him, I'll see you in the morning. Are you with me? He will be there. What a great opportunity we have to sell the milk of human kindness. Not pushily. Not because we are right now. Because we love people who are with us. And so I think of Bob this afternoon here. The spirit lives on, doesn't it? The spirit of love, the spirit of reaching out to people. To be more considerate, to be kind, to be loving. And when we do, the spirit takes over. And the spirit lets us know what we perhaps can help. But this is all a spirit directed effort. This is not getting brownie points. This is just being on our Father's business. Shall we pray? Oh, Father in heaven, you have taken my life and you have remade it and remolded it. And you have brought me much joy, inestimable joy. And seeing people turning around and finding you, and with that, finding the deepest possible meaning available to us as human beings. Lord, you could have used angels, you could have used your spirit, but instead you chose human beings because you want us to join in the victory realm for people like Bob. We're so grateful. Amen.